Elizabeth Knox, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks, John. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited too. Uh, we've been preparing for this episode for a while now, and it's great to get connected and to be talking today about something that's so important and so timely. That is focusing on hybrid work environments and how we can foster synergies and collaborations when we're not together all the time. Um, now, certainly over the course of this past year, many individuals have had to pivot and deal with either virtual work arrangements or hybrid work arrangements. And so I think this is something everyone's been struggling with a bit and trying to wrestle with and figure out. Uh, and you bring a lot of expertise to the table as it comes to this topic. So it's going to be a great conversation. I really appreciate you joining me. As we get started, I wanted to share Elizabeth's bio with everybody. Elizabeth Knox loves to work, but she also knows it's not easy to work well. That's why she started Match Pace. She knows how much companies, government agencies, and nonprofits contribute to the good that the world needs, but only if the people who work there are working well and living well. Elizabeth helps organizations reimagine their workday to focus on the right priorities that drive to the right outcomes so people can be more effective and prevent burnout. Elizabeth is also the creator and host of the podcast, You Need to Stop Doing That, challenging the belief that we should always add more to our lives, more tech solutions, more activities, more relationships, and more stuff. She interviews guests across industries who share their own experience with saying no so they can work and live in line with their priorities. Elizabeth is a business owner, wife, and mother of four young children who speaks from a place of honesty, not as someone who has all the answers, but as someone who, like most of us, is still trying to figure it out and knows that it's a lifelong process. Elizabeth's writing has been featured in the Huffington Post, Thrive Global, Today's Parents, and Today's Christian Women. Her first book, Faith-Powered Profession, A Woman's Guide to Living with Faith and Values in the Workplace, was published in 2013 and helps women grasp the importance and power of their professional work. Her latest book, Exploring the Importance of Working at the Right Pace, is set to be published in 2021. Again, Elizabeth, thank you for joining me. It's a real pleasure to have you. Um, before we really dive on into the nitty gritty of our conversation, anything you would like to share with listeners by way of background or personal context? No, um, thanks for the introduction and just, you know, context in terms of where I am at the moment. Um, as you know, John, I am in my mobile office. Um, I live in Washington, D.C., and I am parked outside of the Franciscan Monastery, which is this oh, wonderful. beautiful, beautiful um, piece of land in Northeast D.C. that most people don't get to see. But between children and neighbors having construction, this was the safest place to have a, have a quiet, um, quiet room for our audio recording. Well, wonderful. And I, I appreciate your flexibility. And uh, I interviewed uh, a gentleman from the DC area a week or two ago who was caught in traffic. So he was <laughs> headed to his office to, to record and he ended up just pulling off to the side of the road and doing it in his car. So, hey, you know, you do what you got to do. We're all flexing. So yeah, nice. That's, that's absolutely right. Well, excellent. And it really actually fits well with the topic for today, right? We're talking about being flexible in the workplace. I love, you know, I'm, as I'm reading your bio and I'm just thinking about all these different principles that are just infused into the work that you do and the way you live your life and, and the work that you, um, you perform, uh, I, I think there are so many lessons there, even if we never got past um, the framing of your bio. But I love the idea of pacing, uh, finding you know, being able to say no. Um, and the one thought that really struck me uh, several times as I was going through your bio was the idea of minimalism. Uh, that's something that my wife and I actually have been embracing more and more in recent years. Uh, and my wife is currently a bit on a minimalist bend of, of just trying to like declutter and get, you know, stuff out. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's physical minimalism, right? Like we mm -hmm. don't need to have all the clutter in our lives physically, but right. it's also the mental minimalism. Like we, we don't mm -hmm. need to overextend ourselves and keep, like you say, don't keep adding more and more and more and more endlessly. Mm -hmm. We, we have to take time to step back, to, to take inventory of our lives and figure out what our priorities are and focus on those things and not allow ourselves to just get bogged down and overwhelmed by all the just continuous stuff. Yeah. No, I mean, when you think of physical minimalism, um, I mean, we are aspirational minimalists as well. Aspirational plus four children. Um, you have six kids, so I think you know the <laughs> drill that 
Um, it's, you know, that is a challenge, but it's, my husband and I will talk about sometimes we spend more time rearranging our crap, you know, that's what we call it. Cause when you're spending time just moving it from place to place or whatever, to make something functional, it doesn't feel like that stuff has as much value as you intended it to. Um, and I think that happens in our workplace as well, that we spend more time rearranging our stuff to try to be able to work well, or kind of managing things that are there that don't actually contribute to the, the most important thing that we want to be working on. And so that's, I wrote an article called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up Your Workday, um, a little riff on Marie Kondo there, and just really thinking about what is essential for me to do my job and what's all this other stuff and can I, you know, eliminate that um, and really just focus on the priorities. So, so yeah, that's a big thing for me personally, like I said, you know, like my bio says, yeah. hey, I'm figuring this out too. And then it's a big thing with clients talking about what really is important and what can you take off of your plates that's distracting you from what's most important. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, so that certainly applies to us on a personal level. Uh, but it also applies to workplaces. And I think about minimalism in work design that mm -hmm. also has a lot of value. And one of the real positive things that I think has come out of the pandemic is it's forced us to reevaluate and challenge our assumptions about the workplace and mm -hmm. what, what is absolutely necessary and what's just the traditional stuff that's always been there that we've just continued to, it's, it's like when you move and you have that box of crap that you move mm -hmm. and keep with <laughs> you for 20 years and it never leaves yeah. the box. Like there's stuff like that in the workplace too, that we just yeah. do because we've always done it. It doesn't right. need to be that way. So we need to right. challenge those assumptions. We need to simplify the workday, simplify the workflow. And oftentimes that can just make a tremendous impact on the productivity, the, the efficiencies and effectiveness of our people and just their happiness level, their engagement level. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, anyways, I think the, the, the pandemic has actually helped in a lot of ways as we've tried to really evaluate those priorities and challenge, you know, the status quo. Yeah. I'm excited to see what comes out of it. I think similar to that box, <laughs> that same box that moves with you through multiple moves or whatever and never gets unpacked. It's daunting to think about examining it and it's going to take time to, I mean, there's one option. Some people say, you know, if you haven't opened it and you know, however many years, just throw it away. And I almost did that and found my grandparents' wedding invitation. So that has stopped me from literally just throwing anything away, which means, you know, you need to go through and see if something valuable is in there. And that requires time in the workplace, you know, to, to look at your systems and look at your processes and look at the way that you work. And I think a lot of people similar to physical clutter are intimidated at the thought of spending time examining how they work. But if you put that parallel to what it's like then when you've actually gotten rid of things that no longer serve you, you get that feeling at work as well. You get the freedom that comes afterwards. Um, and that feeling is, you know, kind of immeasurable um, to have freedom from stuff that is no longer useful, proverbial stuff in the workplace. Yeah, too. it's it's liberating. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, when, when we start to free up our mental bandwidth, our time to focus on those things that really matter most in the workplace, you know, then, then that leads to better collaborations. It leads to better and, and more innovation and innovative mm -hmm. practices and, and things that will just help us be successful and find mm -hmm. fulfillment and satisfaction in the, in our work day. So I think, it, I think it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, so one of the clear outcomes of this pandemic has been, you know, people going into virtual work, uh, but there's been quite a bit of research that's come out, you know, during this year, uh, initially showing, you know, the, the, the difficulties people were having moving mm -hmm. online, going to a virtual kind of a workplace over time, fatigue setting in, um, mm -hmm. and people liked it, but then the fatigue started to set in and loneliness and like disconnection started to set in, uh, and mm -hmm. the realization that there is value in being together in the workplace. And so I think what really I've seen over and over again, in, in some of the recent studies that have come out is that people are settling in on this idea of you know, they really like the flexibility of working remotely, but they really miss the camaraderie. They miss the personal connection of being physically in the workplace. And so we're settling into this idea of there's going to be some sort of hybrid arrangement, probably in most organizations as we come out of the, uh, the pandemic. I know my university, for example, uh, mm -hmm. prior to the pandemic, they, they, I mean, it was kind of our 
archaic the way that they had like uh, anti virtual work policies <laughs> in place. Um, and that all went out the window, right? So now the we, people have been working virtually for the past year. Now we're coming out of this and they're fully embracing the hybrid model uh, and saying, yeah, you know, we're going to, we're going to have hybrid arrangements and people can work, you know, in their physical offices, they can, they can work virtually. And I think it can become the best of both worlds if we do it the right way. So I, I suppose that's really the, the, the key issue at this point in time. Yeah, and I think, you know, there is no one right way, which is simultaneously frustrating and liberating, right? Because there's no one way that you can just say, oh, this is the arrangement that everybody should have. It's really going to be personalized to the organization and whatever level of an organization there may be, you know, what the large organization needs and what individual teams need and everything. And so it's going to require some more of that examination and adjustment that I think is becoming a pretty constant presence in our lives of, you know, responding to change and responding yeah. graciously to change. Um, and so I think that that is, you know, the way that we're looking at it as, you know, on one end of the, sk the spectrum, you could have completely in person. And there might be, I I've actually had a hard time. I'm like, what would actually, what would be need to be done completely in person? Because even at a hospital or at a, now we've got telemedicine or even, you know, at a school, well now, you know, certain roles can be done virtually. Um, you know, so there's completely in person or completely remote. And then in between there is a large spectrum of hybrid and an organization needs to examine what their team needs, what their client needs, um, what they think is right for their collaboration to figure out then where they fall on that spectrum of hi a hybrid work environment. Yeah, and it is a spectrum. So it's clearly not an either or, all virtual, all face to face, uh, mm -hmm. or this exact middle point of saying, you know, right in the middle, we're going to focus on, you know, like 50 50 split, right? It's, it, it has to be um, tailored. And certainly every organization is going to be a little bit different in how they approach it. But you, you pointed out that teams and div divisions and teams within the same organization needs to have the flexibility to adapt in a way that makes sense for them and their work processes and workflows and the type of customer facing roles they may or may not have and such, you know, so there's all these yeah. considerations that have to go into it. Um, but it, it, you know, if we can start to embrace it and start to do the work of really, cons you know, uh, taking a good hard look at, um, our work arrangements, you know, then I think we can find a balance that's going to work for the organization, for the employees, for the customers, and be a win-win-win all the way around. We've already referred a little bit to, you know, some of why hybrid work seems so appealing to people. Um, any other thoughts you have with regards to the, the appeal factor of hybrid work? I actually want to pause and key in on something that you said oh, sure. in what you were just saying, and then I'll come back to the appealing part, but you mentioned a 50-50 split and it's not going to be. And so we're actually encouraging people to think about themselves as either in-person first or remote first. And it doesn't mean that it's not going to be a mix, but you're, if you can think of yourself that way and hey, our, you know, the way that we collaborate, where our clients are, you know, I'm thinking a university is probably an in-person first organization. And then there are questions as an in-person first organization that you can ask yourself to ensure that you are you know, providing what you need to for your team, for your clients, you know, for the students, for the equity of everybody, you know, everybody's participation and opportunity, you know, and if you're a remote first, there are different questions that you ask yourself and different accommodations that you make. And so we're actually, you know, trying to say, hey, it's not, it doesn't mean you can't switch. It doesn't mean there aren't elements of the other part, but if you can think of yourself as either remote first or in-person first, it will clarify those questions that you need to ask yourself. And we actually have a list of questions um, for organizations to ask themselves to be able to do that well, instead of pretending that they are a 50-50 split or pretending that there aren't considerations to take if they choose, you know, wh whichever they choose. So, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I would just add to that, just having a little bit of um, flexibility uh, around mm -hmm. these arrangements um, mm -hmm. it goes a really long way. So if mm -hmm. someone, you know, sees themselves as a, as a face-to-face -face first employee, but they know, mm -hmm. they, they, they know that th there's the, the possibility and the potential that if 
you know, they need to, for whatever reason, take care of family matters at home and they mm -hmm. can work from home, you know, a day a week, uh, or on a particular week, maybe a couple days that week or whatever. And mm -hmm. it's not the end of the world and they're not going to be fighting some huge battle to be able to make that happen. Right. There's a lot of reassurance there for people, right? Just having that, the, the, the idea of that flexibility. Right, exactly. And then, you know, if you decide as an organization, hey, we're an in-person first organization, then the, there are, you know, one of the questions is, hey, how do we make working from home, you know, how do we provide opportunities for people who want to work from home, work remotely occasionally? What are the rules of engagement? How do we handle it? And then you can set, you know, some norms around that so people know that it's accessible to them and it's not, you know, then it's just, it's about lots and lots of good communication um, and yeah. making sure those things are covered. So, so yeah. Very good. Very good. So one of the appealing factors is the flexibility piece that I just mentioned. What are some of the right. other um, appealing uh, factors behind this hybrid kind of an arrangement? I mean, I think it really, I think it all, it's, it's um, variations on a theme of flexibility, right? So there's everything from cutting down on commuting times to, you know, the ability to, you know, use that time then to spend with their families or pursue hobbies. I mean, there, someone said at the very beginning of the pandemic that, um, you know, there are people who suddenly found themselves with a whole lot more time and some people who suddenly found themselves with a lot less time, you know, and it was usually the people with small children who had a lot less time because the responsibilities had gone up and were simultaneous, um, you know, but I think now people will be able to use commuting time to spend with their families or do hobbies or, um, and I think that's what people want is more control or autonomy. I think control sounds controlling or negative, but it's more autonomy. Um, and I think a hybrid work environment could provide more autonomy for people. Um, and I think for organizations, it can provide the opportunity to provide autonomy, which is really great for retention. That's what people are looking for. Um, I'm curious to see the real estate solutions that people are going to come up with if they're only going to be using office space a yeah. certain number of days or certain, you know, it'll be interesting to see if people can get their fixed cost of real estate down. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think that it really, all of the, all of the benefits fall under flexibility, you know, the ability for people to get their work done, you know, from a parking lot or something, if they, if that's what they need, um, you know, but without that, I mean, at MatchPace, we're really about working well and living well. So it's not about people being available all the time. Um, it's about, you know, it's not about people overworking. That's one of the downsides, I think, of the pandemic is that there's been no demarcation. Yep, um, yep. You know, you wake up and your computer's right there and you just check one more time before you go to bed or whatever. So I would I, like I'm, see... I'm guilty of that. I'm as guilty as anyone, you know, and and on, on the one hand, I love the autonomy. I love the flexibility. Um but it's also really, really darn easy for me to just slip into working at times I never would have before, uh, just because yeah. it's it's around you always. Um, I am horrible at quoting stats, so I don't know. Exactly oh, that's okay. Where just from, say eighty percent. Yeah. yeah, eighty percent. Right. <laughs> but they they air quotes whoever they are say that you lose everybody loses seven to nine hours of sleep per week because of devices. And mm -hmm. I can see it so easily because, you know, I used to be really good about leaving my phone downstairs. And then when the pandemic started, I felt like the tsunami was coming and I just had to have it near me, you know, at all times. I've since adapted from that, but, you know, then you're just checking and then you end up scrolling for another hour that you otherwise would have been reading and falling asleep, or if you look at it first thing in the morning. So if you would like to get seven hours of sleep back, um, you know, my advice would be to get all gadgets out of your room. Um, and, you know, have a bedtime for them that you don't look at them after a certain time or something. So, yeah, um, it's, it's a great tip and I, I need yeah. to uh, heed your advice, <laughs> yeah. I think. Very good. So I, I think, you know, we've already talked a little bit about how there's not like one specific right way or wrong way um, that we need to be open to the nuance of, you know, context and individual organizational and team settings. Right. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are some of the, the other things that we should be considering, the types of questions we should be asking as we're thinking about the structure of our workplace, um, how we're considering, you know, and, and balancing the needs of the clients and your team, you know, as you're considering all the options? Mm -hmm. I think there's 
there are two things that I always keep in mind um, when talking about, you know, what this is, is organizational change, right? Or organizational design. And the things that I keep in mind are that we tend to realize that no relationship is static and relationships take work and, and work can be in a good way, you know, that it's a good thing to maintain healthy relationships and, oh, this has changed for someone. And so now they like to be communicated with this way or that way or whatever. And, you know, and relationships take, you know, attention and, you know, tender and lo tender loving care or something that it's, we want to be present in our relationships and an organization is a relationship. It's relationships with people. And so it requires being present and paying attention and adapting um, as the organization adapts. And I know that in some regards that can feel exhausting. Like when will everything just be settled? But the reality is, and I think that's accelerating in our lifetime that change is constant. And so it's being ready to keep adapting um, is probably the first thing I would say. And then the second is just clarity. And that's also, you know, a parallel with the relationships, just lots and lots of clarity about, you know, we talk a lot about an organization's values and how they're living by their values and making decisions by their values. We also talk a lot about norms, which are usually, unfortunately, unspoken and unwritten rules for how an organization functions. And we're really big on uncovering those and speaking them out. And then when people know, hey, yeah, we say our workday ends at X, but the boss is around until, you know, Y, people can make a decision. Oh, okay, now I know that. Now I know what's expected. Is this for me or not? That's fine. You know, it's fine to make that decision. Is this for me or not? But but then also people are just more honest with each other about who they are as an organization. And so I think, you know, recognizing that things will continually be changing um, and uncovering any unspoken or unwritten things that are also changing. And then lots and lots of communication, um, I think are going to be the, some of the foundational ways to work through, you know, deciding and evolving a hybrid work environment. Yeah, that communication piece I, I don't think we can understate how important that is <laughs> uh, at every level, at every stage within the organization, from the point you're just having those direct conversations with your team, with the people um, who are doing the work. What do they need? What do they want? Um, what's important to them? Being able to then aggregate that, you know, communicate it up the line you know, have it influence the, the decision-making process around policies and procedures that the organization is going to adopt and then communicate that back down clearly and just have continuous channels of those of that communication that can occur as you're iterating and trying to figure things out. Because uh, if you're restructuring and you're changing the way work is done in your organization, regardless of best intentions, it's not always going to work perfectly. And sometimes there's going to be hiccups. Sometimes yeah. someone who thinks that they want to be, you know, uh, remote first, they realize over time that that's not the best fit for them. Right. And so mm -hmm. you just got to be open and flexible to th that continual conversation, continual mm -hmm. communication. Uh, and then you're going to be able to, to achieve ultimately what your goal is. And that is success for the organization, success for the team recognizing exactly. there's not a one size fits all. Exactly, exactly. And I think, you know, that's the world that we live in. So as people are sorting that out, you know, just keeping that in mind that it's, it's going to be ongoing. There's going to be a lot of piloting and adjusting and just staying in clear communication. Um, that's what's going to, like you said, be the best for the organization and best for the team, um, you know, which are hopefully the same thing. Um, you know, you want the, the idea, you know, I again, back to my bio, it's like, I really care about how we work and that we work well. And I think work contributes so much to how we solve problems in the world and how we, you know, figure things out. And so I want people to work well and live well. So excellent, <laughs> I keep coming excellent. back. These are my, <laughs> this is what I'm all about. So. Yep, absolutely. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Elizabeth, it has been a real pleasure talking with you. Uh, the time has flown by. I couldn't believe that we're already almost to the end of our interview slot, um, but I do want to be respectful of your time. I know you have uh, a busy day ahead, so I want to let you go. But before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, your business, your podcast, uh, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, so 
the best place to go is matchpace.net, M-A-T-C-H-P-A-C-E. So the idea is that you want your organization running at a healthy, sustainable pace, and you want your team running at the same or a matched pace. So matchpace.net um, is the is the place to go to find all of that information. And then the final word would just be, it's exciting um, to have this opportunity to rethink how we work. And so while it's a little bit intimidating or it might feel like some work, it's a really great opportunity. And so I'm excited for organizations and people um, as they figure this out. Wonderful. Thank you, Elizabeth. It has been a real pleasure. You're welcome back on the podcast anytime. I think we're kindred spirits when it comes to our um, interest and focus on these types of issues. Uh, it's just yeah. very, very important. Uh, I hope listeners will reach out, get connected with Elizabeth, find out more about what she and her company can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.